Welcome to Live Players, where political scientists and strategists Sam Oberia and I discuss the key individuals with the power to alter our current society. Every week, we provide analysis of the news and case studies of live players, as well as key institutions and technologies that make up the global power landscape. Let's dive in. So Tucker Putin, we had a, a great piece of media that gave us some insight into Putin's mind, gave us some insight into Tucker and how people would respond to him. Why don't you share his initial reflections from the interview? You know, I didn't even find the history that boring, but I certainly understand why that was the first reaction of everyone watching the interview. I think that the two interpretations that people have floated for why the interview opens with this like almost 30 year review of history, or at least Putin and the Russian historiography's perspective on the common history between Russia and Ukraine and that region. The reason I, th I think is because he is advocating to a still domestic audience. So this interview is a big deal inside of Russia, not just outside of Russia. And the domestic audience basically needs to almost be reassured about the positive vision of the war in a weird way, the humaneness of the war, the justifications for the war. Since as was you know discussed at length, there have been longstanding personal ties, right? Something that's neglected today is that many Russians and many Ukrainians still have family on each side of that conflict. People that are perhaps still living in these countries. The other interpretation is it could be considered a sort of stalling tactic, but I think that doesn't really make sense since ultimately the interview was so long, right? The interview, if you are trying to basically filibuster to avoid all difficult questions. Uh, in that case, you don't extend the interview. You don't allow it to be something that goes on for two hours. You have it be one hour and you kind of waste half of it. And the other half, you go through your own uh, personal talking points. So in an interesting way, I think that the story he told does not matter to us in the Western world. It's immaterial whether or not this telling of history is true. It does not move us to either be in favor or to be, you know, even more against uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But to his perspective, it's basically still shoring up what has always been domestically a very shaky case. And I think it's a case he genuinely believes, which is perhaps one of the weirdest um, aspects of this, since people are no longer quite used to just how idiosyncratic, let's say, older politicians can get. And won't you briefly just explain that case and what that case Im implies as to what he might do in the future be, or want to do beyond just Ukraine? I think that he has very seriously pursued diplomatic avenues to basically the merger of Russia and Belarus for a very long time. Viewers might not be aware of the so-called Eurasian Economic Union, which was this body that was supposed to be competitive with the European Union to basically produce like, you know, a free trade zone, but also some elements of political unification between Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus. There is also an even closer body called the Union State, which was this treaty that was signed not long after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I believe it was signed towards the late 1990s where the concept was that the Russian Federation and Belarus would merge. Viktor Lukashenko, the uh, leader and many say dictator of Belarus, was at first in favor of that proposal. However, ironically, it was Vladimir Putin coming to power in Russia that caused Lukashenko to stall that proposal. If you are Lukashenko and you're merging your own state with Russia and Yeltsin is in charge of Russia, well, Maybe you imagine yourself the ruler of Russia, but if you're merging it when Putin is in charge, two rather autocratic leaders, or at least certainly very strong personalities, very different personalities, would not necessarily get along in the same state. So the political effect of, say, a rotating presidency between the Belarus president 
and the Russian president might be markedly different. In practice, it would be sort of the absorption or annexation of Belarus into Putin's Russia. Lukashenko had his own protests a little before the war began that were threatening to topple his government. And it was Putin's sort of material, security, military support that kept him in power. So now whether Lukashenko wants it or not, the union state is coming into existence. Though I am certain that Lukashenko has taken steps to frustrate Putin in any request that he might have for Belarus to also enter the war. I don't know if you remember, but in the early stages of the war, there were significant Russian troops in Belarus. And it was an open question as to whether Belarus would join in the war, right? And, and invade Ukraine as well, and whether the Russians would come in from the north as well. So if Lukashenko is slow walking it, then Putin will pursue integration. But if Lukashenko like breaks away from this course, which is supposed to result in gathering Belarus back into this uh, greater Russian state that he imagines, uh, in that case, I think he will try to replace the government. And potentially, though I don't think this is likely, potentially if the war in Ukraine was concluded, he might pursue war with Belarus as well. I think this historical perspective he has is that Belarus, Ukrainian, Russian, uh, these are basically the same extended language, the same extended people, the same extended culture. This is why he put emphasis on Christian orthodoxy in his analysis of the big history, right? He was making almost this civilizational case and that it's only the, you know, fickle nature of geopolitics that has resulted in some of these territories ending up outside of Russia, right? That's why he had so much focus on the minutia, the bureaucratic details, the thing like Khrushchev giving Crimea to Ukraine or the inclusion of new Russia, Novi Russian land into Ukraine uh, during the Tsarist period and so on. He felt that there was these like basically arbitrary and trivial administrative decisions that upon the collapse of the Soviet Union became real political divisions. These are sort of like capricious and insubstantial and something that every good statesman should try to overturn. It's also, however, the case for at least every good Russian statesman, maybe even from his perspective, Ukrainian or Belarusian statesmen should feel the same. So I think that he talks about this, he expands on it, and this is the reason that, say, when in the interview, he talks so much about orthodoxy, but when Tucker asks him a question of like, you know, basically, do you feel there are supernatural forces at work in the world? Putin responds as if Tucker missed the point, because Tucker did miss the point. The point isn't which religion we have. The point is we historically had the same religion. The orthodoxy argument wasn't really a religious argument by Putin at all. It was just an argument that hey, these are all the reasons we're basically the same people, and this is basically a civil war, and it's unfortunate, and the West is somewhat to blame, but somewhat to blame is this like strange idea they've gotten into their head that they're not Russians, which, of course, the Ukrainians disagree with, especially now, but the dimension there was missed. And I think Tucker was just trying to play to his still predominantly conservative audience where the uh, question of whether Putin is personally religious is very important for whether Putin is a good man or not, right? And that's, that's the kind of expression that even if you are religious in Russian politics, you would not raise it. Why would you not raise it? Because to raise personal religious belief in a multi-faith country like Russia that is, you know, doesn't really have the civic cohesion necessarily, has a very different cohesion contrasted with, say, the United States, you know, that implicitly might dismay the Buddhists or the Muslims, or even to a lesser extent, the Jewish minority of Russia. And that's why he went and gave that answer. It felt like a non sequitur answer. But from his perspective, I think Tucker was basically asking him, well, are you going to institute a theocracy inside of Russia? Tucker wasn't asking that. He was just asking him, are you a good man? But uh, Putin was replying to the question of what is the standard on which a politician should be judged? If it is Christianity, then, well, Russia would be in trouble. Some people saw that interview and, and said, hey, 
you know, if, if he's commenting on the cultural linguistic sort of similarities between the Ukraine and Russia, what does it mean about Poland or other places? Is Putin an ethnic imp- imperialist? What, what are your thoughts on, on that? Noah Smith wrote, wrote a piece saying, you know, the war is ultimately about Poland, actually. I think there's some element of truth to this where many of the arguments that he uses for discussing, say, why Ukraine is a problematic state also apply to Poland, right? He uses this argument that there is a desire to build up military potential, right? Poland has a sort of a 4% of its uh, GDP is currently spent on defense. I think this is wise, but note this is much higher than the EU average. It is beyond the 2% minimum uh, that's basically suggested by NATO, a minimum that many European countries fail to meet. Poland is also described as a geopolitical stumbling block in a possible collaboration with Germany, where he talked at some point about the delivery of gas into Germany and how he thinks it's a geopolitical mistake for the Germans themselves because it will result in their economy no longer being competitive. However, having said all of this, I think a Russian invasion of Poland is wildly implausible in the near future. And in particular, his same obsession with history, and we could call it an obsession, let's say, but his argument was not a pan-Slavic argument, if you examine it carefully. Poland is Catholic. He would not deny it. In fact, in his telling of history, he proposed that, you know, because Ukraine came under Polish domination because Ukraine was part of these other um, entities. Uh, That's why they diverged. So I think from his perspective, Poland is a hostile country, or he would paint it as a hostile country. Uh, But I don't think he would pursue any sort of territorial expansion into Poland, because in his telling, uh, the Poles were never a state-forming people. So he believes that there were a certain number of state-forming peoples that gave rise to Russia. Maybe one way to think about this is, imagine the United Kingdom, you know, the end of the British Empire is somewhat worse than previously thought. And there's some civil wars, or there's a bigger economic collapse. And then right away in like 1950 or whatever, 1955, Scotland declares independence, Wales declares independence, Cornwall declares independence, Northern Ireland is of course lost. And then you have an English politician, maybe a somewhat nationalist one, arguing various strange uh, theses about how Wales and Scotland, if you think about it, are really part of England. And pointing out obscurities such as that, oh, you know, the Acts of Union actually came under a Scottish king unifying with England because Scotland uh, failed and bankrupted itself with a major colonial venture and basically needed to be bailed out by England, right? So that analogy might make sense. That in itself would not mean that it's necessarily that hypothetical, you know, nearly destroyed Britain or England would be a threat for the Netherlands, let's say, or Denmark. Uh, But it does mean it might regard, say, France or the United States or these other countries with hostility. So thinking about this, I think that the Baltic states perhaps are in some danger because there are significant minorities of just Orthodox Slavic people there. He is, I think, pretty intentionally pursuing this sort of vision of a clear alternative to the West. And I think in his perspectives, the Poles, the Czechs, the Slovaks, Slovenians, Croatians, historically, they're part of Western civilization. So he would sort of draw the line there. That's a good overview. He would see them more of a a, a, a liability than an asset. And rightly or wrongly, his belief is that if you unify Ukraine and Russia in the long run, inevitably, Uh, the resentments will fade away. And I guess, I don't know, the Ukrainians will learn Russian or something and they'll forget that they were ever Ukrainian. I imagine you'd be dubious of that. I think that at this point, there will be always a committed Ukrainian nationalism. There is historically always this case that war, especially very brutal war, especially prolonged 
war generates a kind of resentment. Now, that doesn't mean that Ukraine will keep all its territory or that all the territories that now speak Ukrainian will always speak Ukrainian. However, if you needed heroes, right, in this long interview, he complained that the sort of only nationalist military heroes the Ukrainians can find who are unambiguously Ukrainian rather than the shared ancestors of both Ukrainians and Russians were World War II era Nazi collaborators. Well, you know, Putin, he's undone this with his own actions. If I'm a Ukrainian nationalist 100 years from now, I'll talk about Zelensky. I'll talk about the current fighting forces. I'm not going to have to reach to a World War II era puppet state. Like, that's not going to be necessary. So in other words, the moral and historical case for Ukrainian nationalism has been made by this war. So if I were provocative, I would say that uh, Putin's case was much stronger historically before the war. This is why when, you know, you read history to make history, you kind of have to be careful. When you try to make history, you might just write another chapter uh, that makes your telling much less compelling. To say more about the political and economic calculus that Russia is going through in terms of right now, the situation that they're in the next few years, what do you expect from them? How do you think this is all going to play out in addition to sort of how, you know, Putin thinks, you know, spiritually or aspirationally or, or morally? What are the facts on the ground? The concrete situation here is that the Western sanctions have failed. The so-called crushing sanctions that were supposed to basically crash Russia's economy have not had that result. Uh, if anything, Russian economic performance seems surprisingly strong. Russian bilateral trade with China is up. Uh, the Russians have even started expanding uh, artillery shell production and have begun manufacturing these drones that they were initially buying from Iran. I don't know if you remember, but a year or two ago, it was a pretty big deal when Iran started selling drones. This means that they are slowly expanding their military production and they are suffering no budgetary shortfalls and they have managed to find replacements for most of the Western economic partnerships. And let's not forget the Ukrainian economic partnerships. Before 2014, the trade between Ukraine and Russia was significant, right? So the result of this is I think there is no economic pressure on Putin to end the war. There is a certain amount of political pressure and different leaders who might propose that he is failing at the war. Since the failed coup or pseudo coup or protest by the Wagner private military corporation, right? You remember that strange drive down the highway with Prigozhin? I think that since then, the amount of criticism or disagreement in public has gone down as well in Russia. There's no political discourse that might suggest that this is being deeply mishandled. It's all varying shades or degrees of what the best approach is and no significant comment on whether the head of state has made any significant mistakes or not. So I think there's very little political capital to mint inside of Russia because the opposition is so feeble and has been so thoroughly crushed in a failed coup. Whenever you have a failed coup, it makes future coups much less likely. Whenever you have a successful coup, it makes future successful coups much more likely, right? This is why you sometimes see these like almost failed state situations where there's a coup and then two years later, there's another coup. And then of course you expect it doesn't end for a little bit, right? Because every time this works, it's a signal to elements of the military that yes, we can seize power or we're actually in charge. And then if something fails as spectacularly as the, you know, Wagner's attempt to influence Russia, right? Because it's not even clear they had a worked out attempt to replace Putin. I think if it fails so spectacularly, it's very much a negative signal. So Putin stays in power. Russia does surprisingly well economically. Russia has increased its military spending. So this means that also military production goes up. They probably will not be any faster at developing new weapons, but they will probably be uh, successful in scaling up the production of 
their latest generation of weapons. So they'll start building more of their relatively modern, though low-cost tanks. And they're going to start building a lot of these very cheap Iranian drones. Honestly, one way to think about the Iranian drones, by the way, is that these are like guided cruise missiles that you can build from off-the-shelf Chinese parts. So they cost $50,000 a piece. Like contrast that with some of the other drone designs that are in play in this war. And you realize how just scaling that up, just assembling more and more of them, again, from fundamental components you just buy from the Chinese, I think that could be very, very damaging in the long run. And that's like a, a formidable weapon. The Russians will honestly pursue basically a kind of regime change in Ukraine. So I think their first goal will be basically, okay, uh, this current government has to go. It's okay if it goes a few years from now, but it has to go. And we need some sort of ceasefire, but the ceasefire will not be a serious ceasefire. It won't be something that I think their side will intend to respect. I think it will be something along the lines of we need five to 10 years of breathing space and for presumably the United States to weaken further. And then we will continue the war until such a point where there is either a favorable government in Ukraine that once more aligns with Russia or most of the territories are piecemeal incorporated into Russia. So will they succeed at this goal? Probably not fully. I think this is one of the key reasons that Poland is important. If they achieve notable success, I suspect there'll be a certain point where Poland might actually send expeditionary forces into Ukraine. That will be somewhat dangerous, but much less dangerous than if the United States was fighting there directly. So if the war goes very badly for Ukraine in its future phases, Polish involvement is likely. If the war goes well for Ukraine, well, it's going to be one of those frozen conflicts with devastating long-term consequences for the economic development of the country. Uh, Ukraine itself has already suffered massive economic damage, devastation in terms of its key eastern cities, of course, but also significant amounts of people left the country. A positive sign is that some of the refugees have returned from Europe back to Ukrainian cities. This is good for the country because basically they'll be experiencing severe demographic shortfalls in the future. So any people at all who feel safe to return, they are helping make a more prosperous Ukraine and also a safer Ukraine because the larger that Ukraine's population is 20, 30, 40 years from now, the costlier any future Russian wars are, the less likely they are, and the less serious the threat to Ukrainian statehood will be. Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsors. The tech world turns to the Brave browser for its unbeatable privacy protections. But did you know that Brave also has a private ad platform? Brave Ads offers first-party targeting, and it's been cookie-less since day one. So you can relax while third-party tracking cookies disappear from the web. Today, millions of people turn to ad blockers to avoid being tracked and pestered online. But Brave's new ad model aligns incentives for users and advertisers. Users earn rewards for viewing ads, which they can save, spend, or pass along to their favorite creators. And advertisers score points for respecting user privacy, generating ROI without invasive tracking. So whether it's high impact announcements on the new tab page or keyword targeted ads in Brave Search, Brave offers diverse, private, future-proof ad formats for all your business goals. Join the future of advertising at brave.com slash ads. Mention MOZ when signing up for a 25% discount on your first campaign. Because you mentioned Poland, let's segue to a, a Bismarck brief you wrote about the transformation in Poland. Why do you unpack some of the major points that, that you were making there? Poland's political economy has undergone this very fundamental change since the end of communism, right? In particular, we should remember that Poland did not have a really native communist revolution of any kind. Rather, a Soviet-like system was imposed by the Russians after World War II. 
As part of this, they undertook a pretty intentional social engineering effort in Poland. For example, the shipyards, ironworks, all of these large industrial operations that were built in Poland were at the center of sometimes entirely new cities, other times rebuilt old cities. Many of these cities had been destroyed by the devastation of World War II. So even when you have a historical city like Warsaw, like because of the terrible fighting that occurred there and both by the Soviets, Nazi Germany, also the resistance forces of Poland, many of these cities were nearly completely demolished. The Soviet approach to how to have a communist regime take root in this country was just one of raw social engineering. Their thinking was that if we urbanize the rural population, if we build industrial style towns, then there will be a proletariat. And the proletariat will, at least in theory, Marxist theory, uh, be in favor of this system of government. So if you eliminate the uh, power of the Catholic Church, if you eliminate the large landowners, if you eliminate the bourgeoisie, which is easy because all the cities are destroyed, and all you have is a country of proletarian towns, they're going to be in favor of continued communist government. Mm -hmm. Things didn't quite work out that way. However, many of the leaders in Poland were educated in this system. So once communism ended, and of course the Soviet Union withdrew, and collapsed very quickly after. The first priority is, well, social engineering has transformed our country into a really statist country with these relatively large companies. Can we reverse this? Can we undo this? Could we encourage the creation of a different political economy that is a different economy of political action where a reversion not to Russian communism, but a kind of Polish socialism would be impossible? Because of the you know, long occupation in the mind of uh, many of the key statesmen of the era, many of the key intellectuals of the era, there was a very strong connection between any kind of socialist system and tyranny, because it was this, again, foreign occupation. And the belief was that even if the foreign occupation is gone, uh, the structural aspects that lead to it, like large, extremely consolidated state-owned companies, that these levers of power have to be disassembled and cannot just be disassembled, but must be actively re-engineered. And to a great extent, I think Poland has succeeded at this in that it intentionally encouraged the creation of many small and medium-sized businesses. It has become a nation of shopkeepers, to use the sort of Adam Smith phrase and Margaret Thatcher phrase. This leaves it with some disadvantages, though. The communist economy was very inefficient, very specialized to operate as part of this, you know, Warsaw Pact concert mm -hmm. where it fulfilled a specific economic role. So, of course, when you remove it and you encourage the creation of small businesses, many small businesses come into being. But this, as you develop a new economy, these new small firms, well, the most natural future direction would be for them to consolidate. This kind of consolidation has not yet happened in Poland. So not a formally state-owned enterprise staffed with political appointees, but more like, you know, will there ever be a Polish Samsung or a Polish Apple or even a Polish Spotify or a Polish SpaceX? These kinds of giant companies don't form very naturally in Poland's current economic environment. For now, at least, a lot of what they do has been, a lot of the larger investments have actually come from Western Europe. Uh, a lot of the car factories and so on are still owned by Germans, French, etc. And I don't think that there's any concrete industrial policy in place to encourage the creation of national champions because the creation or the benefit of these national champion companies uh, that sort of harnessed the economies of scale inherent in industrial production, that feels dangerously too close to the recreation of state-owned enterprises, right? So I think that Poland has shown the strength of a bottom-up economic approach in recovering 
from long-term mismanagement. What it has not done is prioritized sort of the creation of export-oriented giants that come to dominate through economies of scale and through the quality of their products, global exports. Currently, Poland looks much more on the trajectory of, say, a Vietnam, where a lot of the production is done there, uh, a lot of the components are built, but no major company really is driving innovation. Rather, it's foreign companies that are pursuing innovation there. Uh, so more on the course of Vietnam than on the course of a South Korea. We could also ask the question of how long-term will this successful creation of a middle-class society be? You know, I think one of the major Polish parties, for example, is basically the car owner's party, which is sort of like, you know, taxi drivers, commuters, and truckers. Like, can you imagine if, you know, that was a political party in the U.S.? Of course, it's, it's a pretty, you know, for Polish circumstances, fairly libertarian party, uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, but it just shows how uh, local and citizen-oriented uh, some of the political thinking is. So having said that, will this political economy succeed? Well, it prevented the state-owned companies becoming bastions of power for people who were active in the previous regime. So it actually broke the political continuity with the communist Poland. It got those people out of power. That worked. It also encouraged s strong economic growth up to a certain ceiling. That worked, right? It's not going to work, I think, for without active industrial policy to jump to the next level of income. So they're going to, I think, struggle to reach the kind of level of wealth that we see in places like South Korea. They probably will eventually catch up to Germany, but it's going to be a long, windy road. And, you know, maybe Germany will actually become much poorer before uh, the Poles actually become as rich as Germany used to be because of its energy policy and demographic problems. However, politically, culturally, I feel the power of the Catholic Church and with it Polish nationalism is already evaporating. In the communist story, the Catholic Church was important to national identity because it was one of the forces of opposition to the previous government. And it enjoyed massive moral authority in the immediate aftermath. After all, John Paul II was also a Polish pope, something uh, the people could be proud of. And it also made for this sort of like strong association between the two. Having created a middle-class society that is basically consumerist, I think they have undercut the uh, religiosity of their society. So if you're thinking about this as sort of a conservative politician, I would not be optimistic about how conservative Poland will be in the future. Rather, by default, I would expect it to secularize fairly rapidly, as is typical of Catholic countries. Consider, for example, Spain or Portugal or Ireland, once extremely religious societies, after a series of scandals and also after becoming notably richer than they were before, now fairly secular societies with a much diminished Catholic church. Removing Catholicism what are you left with in terms of Polish nationalism? Well, the Polish language, Polish culture, okay, that works. But there is no sort of coherent social policy that would be different than what other European countries are doing. So if you look at it from a purely economic lens, uh, of course, it makes a lot of sense to encourage immigration from countries such as Vietnam, actually, the Philippines, uh, Pakistan, and so on. And because economic growth is still solid and your population is shrinking, new voters are imported, the demand for pensions remains high, uh, I think over time, Poland will find it tricky to maintain the defense expenditure that is required to be secure from Russia. Because Russia, again, is not a benign country. The reason why Russia is unlikely to intervene with Poland is because Poland is relatively strong and becoming stronger. Poland will find it difficult to maintain that high level of military spending simultaneously with a ever worsening pension burden as its population undergoes demographic transition. 
and as its fertility is almost certain to decline notably as the societal values come to match Western European values, right? So it's not that Catholicism in particular is that vital to fertility. There are all sorts of other uh, approaches one can have, but the decline of Catholicism is an indication of cultural convergence and modernity in Poland. So it is happening at the same time. I'm sure it cross influences the fertility, but it's a strong indicator. I think the fertility will go down as well over time. And then you basically have the same political economy that you see in Western Europe. You no longer have a nation of shopkeepers. What you instead have is a nation of the taxed and those on whose behalf the country is taxed, as is commonly seen in a lot of Europe, where in the class of people who are doing the taxation, it's actually going to be the older generations. Like the pensioners all over Europe are generally in favor of large wealth transfers. So this is different than what you might see in the United States. In some cases, such as Portugal, actually, uh, the right-wing parties do notably better. So not center-right, but even far-right parties do much better among voters under 35 and 40. And they do relatively poorly with older voters. So you have an interesting dynamic in Europe that's not seen in the United States because of the older population, the much more sluggish economic growth, and the ever rising burden of transfers to an ever older population of pensioners where the question is like, how are you going to achieve that? And then if you try to, you know, basically import more people, some countries will have done a good job. Other countries have done a bad job of culturally integrating them. It's not as clear a win as it is in the United States. Uh, the result is like often lackluster economic growth, internal divisions, culture war as well. I think being a Polish nationalist is already controversial right now, but I think it will become more controversial and culturally coded. So I expect the ambient level of patriotism to decline. And then that will be reflected in support for things like military spending in the future. So um, I think Poland's situation right now is that it will become a normal Western European country. And to Polish people, this probably sounds great, but I think if you spend a lot of time in Western Europe and you think about its future, one is rather hopeful that the Polish find some alternative. A couple of follow-ups. Talk more about Poland's role within Europe or, or how it interplays with the rest of Europe or what its success portends about Europe. Well, Poland is, I think, a natural political ally to the United States with regard to policies in Eastern Europe, because they have a vested security interest in the Baltic states remaining independent, and at the end of the day, Ukraine remaining independent. And for Russia, who they share a border with the exclave of Kaliningrad, this is an existential political question. Germans or those in France and so on, for them, there are no big consequences if Ukraine were to fall. And for the Germans, at least, even though they ideologically are currently uh, set against it and probably also uh, set against it because of their affiliation with the United States and the pressures that they experience from the United States, uh, I think that they will basically find a perpetual temptation to rely on Russia once more for energy. Let's remember that a lot of these energy deals actually go back into the Cold War. People were debating the wisdom of pipelines from Russia in the 1980s already, right? So this was proper Cold War era. There were energy exports from Russia to Europe and pipelines were being built and discussed and debated. So at the end of the day, geopolitically, Germany is never that interested fundamentally in what's happening in that part of the world, Poland is. This means that among EU countries, there is a constant disagreement as to the set of priorities one should have with regard to Eastern Europe. Secondly, Poland and many countries such as Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, the Visegrad group, but also all new members in general, tends to have 
a more libertarian approach to business where they don't want to hyper-regulate quite as much as, say, France and Germany do. Because France and Germany are, of course, in favor of regulation, since regulation protects incumbents in a market. And in the European common market, who is the newcomer? Uh, a new Polish company struggling to grow? And who is the incumbent? Well, an old German company, probably founded in 1903, that Germans don't want to fail. So there's an implicit sort of logic, protectionist logic, hiding under the surface of the overregulation of the economy coming from Brussels. The logic is, how can we set rules where we have full access to Eastern Europe's markets, but our largest companies are not threatened by competition from Eastern Europe? And the answer is, you raise barriers to entry. Like you open the market up to between the countries, you eliminate trade barriers, but you ratchet up the regulations that apply to all of these countries. And then the larger companies can endure those burdens better than any new competitor or upstart competitor might be. So that role in Poland is also this kind of, it's also one of the few European countries with solid economic growth. So the political incentives of Poland's leadership are different. Uh, they can, to their voters, promise to divide a future pie that is larger. This is not a promise the German leadership can credibly make to German voters. All they can say is, as the pie shrinks, you will receive your fair share of the pie. And it's good that the pie is shrinking because that's good for the planet. And we will emit less CO2. It's not that our economy has shrunk. We're emitting less CO2. Another thing you say about Poland is that it is a more egalitarian society or, or more equal society. T talk a little bit about that, more about how much that matters for social cohesion. Is that something that's overstated um, by sort of intellectuals? What, what is the right way of thinking about the role of uh, that inequality plays in society? Yeah, like wealth inequality is just actually kind of low in Poland. And one way to think about it is that uh, most people have only begun to accumulate wealth. And the sort of differential between uh, the different classes in Poland is for now very small. I think if future economic dynamism happens, the inequality will basically shoot up just as a natural consequence of some people lose, some people win. In relative senses, everyone is, of course, getting richer in that scenario. Uh, if you examine modern South Korea, it's almost like cartoonishly unequal from the very richest to compared to the middle class. The United States has relatively high inequality as well, though also degree of mass affluence that's still rare in the world. For Poland, the equality is not currently state imposed. It's just sort of an artifact of how this very small scale businesses operate, right? There's not like someone that's like super wealthy necessarily. There are not that many Polish billionaires yet, but there are many people who own these small businesses the businesses that are run in such a way that they can't scale. It's kind of impossible to scale a mom and pop shop. It only gets driven out of business. And then maybe mom and pop work for the chain that came in, et cetera. The quality is vital, I think, for the establishment of a sense of national solidarity, right? So I think that countries that have lower inequality, all else equal, which is very rarely the case, high equality nations, all else equal, tend to be more nationalist. Because generally speaking, your destiny is tied to the destiny of your fellow citizens. With a sufficient amount of wealth, of course, you can purchase exit from it, which is good, especially if one is persecuted. But it also means that you always have options. It's like, do I need to be in Poland? Or can I live in a very nice house in Monaco? Or can I live even in a less nice but pretty nice house in the United States in New York, right? These sorts of uh, decisions, these sorts of thoughts, um, they matter at the highest level of talent. And then the delta also between going into politics or, say, creating a company is smaller. Uh, it's very easy to argue to someone in Poland that if you're exceptionally talented, you should go into politics. 
that becomes harder to argue in the United States, except for the very highest offices, mostly because uh, the route is not as well remunerated. So one way I could phrase this is in a relatively equal Poland, the brain drain between sectors, it's not brain drain between countries, but brain drain between different sectors of the economy, it's very low, right? And this means that you will have smart people in many different industries. In the modern United States, until SpaceX emerged, you were making a clear mistake if you became a aerospace engineer rather than a software engineer. And many, many people I know who are trained to be pharmacists, who trained to be doctors, who trained to be physicists, who trained to be mathematicians, who trained to be aerospace engineers, of course, pivoted to just becoming software engineers or maybe company founders if they had some sort of commercial experience. Poland will basically not, you know, it will have a more even distribution of talent. So again, this equality aspect sort of helps if you're trying to develop in several directions simultaneously from a relatively low st starting point. Uh, and I think this is one of the reasons you have this sort of political science result that around the world, when you look at the like underdeveloped countries or lower middle income countries, a low inequality index is tied to also to low corruption and relatively good public health outcomes and so on. In the big picture, I think this, you know, this breaks down and I think that these measures are missing something, but I think in these like early stages of development or in the stages of say recovery from communism, these are good developments because let's consider not all inequality is created equal. The rapacious oligarchs, of Russia and Ukraine were the result of privatization where the large companies remained large and were sold very cheaply to politically connected people. These were not Elon Musk's, right? These were not Jeff Bezos's. These were randos sometimes, and they misran these companies terribly and no one could really replace them because the company had government favor. So the companies underperformed. They still had benefits of scale. Scale is very important, but they underperformed notably. One of the only functional Russian companies, Yandex, was not that. It was actually a bottom-up company that is now sort of in the process of being integrated into Russia's politics. But this meant that both the pre-Putin regime and the Putin regime had a lot of people who were very wealthy and were politically well-connected and could focus on extraction of wealth and understood their core skill to be basically a form of taxation, maybe not explicit taxation through redistribution, but taxation through monopolies, favors, special treatment in courts, et cetera, et cetera, collecting rent, as economists would say. Ukraine had a very similar problem and might actually break free of it through the course of this war. It really rests on a lot of the political outcomes and the concrete decisions made. Since war, in a way, is an artificial equalizer, especially a defensive war, right? We are all in this together. We can't leave. In fact, if I try to leave as a man, I'll you know, be conscripted on the border and sent back to fight on the fronts. That was happening earlier in the war. So we might as well do the best we can with this collective effort. It's like the impossibility of exit results in a kind of bridge burning that even if people are not materially equal, well, everyone's future is at stake and we're faced with a similar set of problems. So uh, artificially making society equal or, or pushing it into war, almost always bad. Finding yourself in a defensive war, sometimes it can actually fix the politics of your country to a very great degree. Even systems that are very, very broken, right? I would argue that, you know, Stalin's government within the Soviet Union became much more powerful after Hitler's invasion, right, than it had ever been before and received much broader and deeper support than it had before. It certainly is the case that many factions of Russian society that had been uh, opposed to uh, the Communist Party came to be aligned with it, including the Russian Orthodox Church uh, around 1944 and 45 was like sort of endorsing it as a Christian duty to defend the Soviet Union versus Germany. 
For Poland, though, to return to Poland, it faces a energy challenge because it does not have a lot of fossil fuels and it cannot burn the fossil fuels because it's sort of stuck in the complete regulatory chokehold of Europe's green policies, which will always be enforced by countries like Germany. It has relatively cheap electricity and could have much cheaper electricity. I suspect that depending on how rapid the cultural convergence is to Western Europe, Poland might develop the means to have nuclear weapons at its disposal. It has nuclear reactors that are scheduled to be built. I think the security argument is very strong. I think that if, say, the Baltic states were ever invaded by Russia, which I do think is plausible, but I would expect that to happen only after Russia has considered the Ukraine war basically finished and has even more closely tied Belarus because you cannot really uh, operate in the Baltic area without Belarus's cooperation. If those two preconditions are met and Russia invades, I'm not sure NATO's Article 5 will be quite as ironclad as everyone pretends. And in the aftermath of that, if World War III has not been started over Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, in that situation, how does the United States possibly convince its allies that it's serious in defending them? How does it convince them to commit to NATO? How does it convince Poland that it has its back? Well, in that situation, an informal agreement with Poland that if it develops nuclear weapons, we will look the other way on non-proliferation treaties, I think it starts becoming uh, very probable. So I would say, you know, I would put 15% odds that actually 20% odds that within the next 20 years, Poland has nuclear weapons. And this is one of these things that I think seems fantastical because we're used to Europe as a peaceful and stable place where countries don't develop weapons of mass destruction. But it's been in our recent history. The US wasn't in favor of France or Britain developing nuclear weapons, actually. They had to do it on their own. And uh, Sweden, as well as Switzerland, two at the time neutral countries, officially on the books, were developing nuclear weapons up until the late 1980s. They only stopped developing those weapons. First off, they could have completed developing them, but that in a way almost makes you a target. You want to be very close to having a nuclear weapon, but not have it if the big boys, that is the United States and Russia, are fighting a nuclear war, because you don't want to be uh, struck preemptively. You do, however, want to discourage conventional attacks on you as a small state or a medium-sized state. So the result of this was also that, say, the Swiss and the, and the Swedish invested in aerospace because they needed their own fighters to deliver the bombs. They never pursued missile technology, but you know a fighter can do a pretty good job anyway. A bomber can do a pretty good job anyway. And you know, as the Soviet Union collapsed, they moved away from this. But... If Russia were to rebuild this potential, I think that Poland would pursue this. Now, I couch this with political convergence because if the Polish population of 2030 or 2040 will be ideologically closer to Germans today than Polish people today, they might become just anti-nuclear. And if you close down nuclear power plants, there's no way you can then go all the way around and say, well, you know, nuclear energy was bad. Oh, no, we actually need nuclear weapons now. There is a ideological like step function there. I don't think that even with nuclear reactors, it's very hard to persuade people if their country doesn't already have nuclear weapons, that acquiring them is a good idea. It still strikes people as this like really bad thing, this really mm -hmm. negative weapon. Is, is there anything we haven't uh, discussed relative to, to Poland or to Russia that you think you want to leave the listeners with? I would be much more confident in Poland's future if it remained in NATO but left the European Union. I think that it is simply the case that to become a high-income country, some protectionist measures are necessary. You have to wage a trade war. Otherwise, eventually, everything that you make will be made in China. And with the decline of Germany... The need is great for prosperous and growing European economies. If your economy has been stagnant for a very long time, extremely negative and extractive 
political processes lock in. Your elites, perhaps not Russian oligarchs, but still are used to extraction as their main mode of operation. The beauty of Poland is that it's creating new elites and it is uh, a country that has had decades of economic growth, making it a rare, optimistic country in Europe. That kind of legacy and that kind of system could be maintained, but it does require continued growth. So they're going to have to, they're going to have to break ranks with the rest of Europe. There's no way around it. And I say this as someone that likes the European Union, so maybe a reform is possible, but they seem outnumbered. Russia and Israel have sort of a PR challenge, right? We started with Putin and Tucker to influence PR, how he's seen locally. Talk a little bit about the propaganda or media challenge facing countries like Russia or Israel who are caught between a, a rock and a hard place between sort of getting local sentiment on board, but also you know global sentiment. Talk, talk a little bit about that. The commonality of it is that war is very ugly. And as soon as someone dies in a war, both sides try to very clearly blame the other side for having caused the bloodshed. A lot of the propaganda war that's happening between Hamas and Israel is a propaganda war of who to blame for Gazan civilians dying and who uh, to blame for the terrorist attacks. Hamas usually doesn't even try to justify it basically tries to blame Israel as if, you know, Israel is provoking these and that they are resisting colonization, etc. But on, you know, Gazan casualties, it's sort of like a, a game of finger pointing. Similar for Russia, right? It has to either blame Ukraine itself or blame the West because otherwise it is responsible. And because of the ideological constraints that are in place, where Putin within Russia does not tend to say rabidly anti-Ukrainian things because the game that they are proposing is that, you know, these are basically our little Russian brothers. They're just a little confused. And it's these evil people from the Western world that have brainwashed them to think that they are different. And we have to get rid of a few criminals and bad people, but the Ukrainian people are once more going to be our friends after the war. The Ukrainians, of course, just feel like, you know, Russia is this completely imperialistic force that is trying to extinguish them as, as a people. And there's some truth in that, even if it's not like, you know, necessarily a genocidal in that sense. It's certainly assimilationist in its tendencies. When it comes to an international audience, Israel and Russia have two different challenges. Israel has to produce a positive moral case for its actions because it's much more integrated into the Western world. And it is all else equal a state that greatly depends on its ties and influence in the United States. So Israel has to present the positive case for its actions. This was in a funny way, the same question that Tucker was sort of asking to Putin is like, justify your invasion, say why you invaded. But Putin doesn't need you to understand why he invaded Ukraine. Russia is a much larger, much stronger country, less dependent on its international connections. Russia doesn't really care or need to care what uh, Republicans or Democrats in the United States think about it to a great extent. What they actually want you to think is that this is a very complicated war and you can't really make sense of it. And at the end of the day, that's an easy propaganda story to spin because it is substantially true. Every country, every war that happens like this is complicated. It is nuanced. And then the question is, can we intervene without understanding? And I think the answer is no. However, I think we should be doing our best to explain this and to understand it as best as possible. So I do think Putin didn't mind being boring. Uh, he didn't mind, you know, being a bit slow, because he doesn't even necessarily want anyone to understand this very well. He just wants them to go away with the sense that it's too much to bother with. It's too complicated. Let's focus on other things. That's a good place to wrap. Samo, as always, a pleasure. Until next time. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for listening to Live Players. Please subscribe, leave a review, and check out Samo's excellent newsletter, The Bismarck Brief, for more rigorous analysis of key individuals, institutions, or industries. Live Players is a production of Turpentine, the podcast network behind Econ 102 with Noah Smith and Moment of Zen.